Okay. Okay, so the first thing I wanted to, to talk briefly about is, you know, this COVID-19 situation we have with the kids. Um, we've, had, we've had one or two cases in Rockland County now, so it, um, it is something, you know, that we're going to see a little more of. So we'll talk about that. And uh, hold on a second, some people are. Okay, so they changed it. Uh, they gave it a name now. So multi-system multi inflammatory syndrome in children. Okay, um, and it, when we talked the last time, I believe I showed you um, some PowerPoints as far as something called Kawasaki syndrome. So in the very beginning, they thought that this was Kawasaki syndrome because a lot of the signs and symptoms were the same. But now they feel that it's not because Kawasaki syndrome had nothing to do with COVID. So they feel this is a, a COVID type of uh, response to the body. And I think the last time we spoke, we talked a little bit about like what's actually happening when a patient gets uh, COVID-19. In other words, what's actually um, killing them. And what's happening is it's an overstimulation of their immune system. And that's why some people get COVID. They get a very mild you know, case or they even they get maybe a, you know, a bad case, but they, they, you know, they don't reach the point of becoming critical. And then other people, you know, uh, move into that critical stage fairly quickly. And what's happening is that their immune system is overreacting. The people that get really sick, and this is what's happening in the kids um, that get this multi-system uh, inflammatory syndrome, the, um, their immune system's over-responding, okay? And when your immune system over-responds, you have something called a cytokine storm. So cytokine is a, um, a substance that's released by the body in response to stress. And the people that are having the issues, um, you know, the, the getting deathly ill issues are having this cytokine storm, which is why all these people they put on vents they thought that was the treatment and that was what's going to save these people. And, and you know, like the, the death rate for people put on events was pretty high because they didn't treat the, the inflammation part of it. They were trying to keep them alive with the, with the ventilator, with the oxygenation, but that really wasn't what the problem, the problem was happening in the blood vessels because of this massive inflammation. And that's, this is what's kind of happening with the kids in the multi-system inflammatory syndrome. So the, the patients, the adult patients, and this could even happen in children, but the adult patients that were going into that respiratory failure. Well, first thing is, the the pulse ox they were using as a treatment guideline was that when patients went to like 92 or 90, they felt that was kind of low and that they needed to be intubated. Some places went as low as 88. And even if people could be conversing, could be talking, but because they had an O2 sat of you know 88, they said they need to get intubated and put on a ventilator. Now the tolerance is much higher. You know, they have people in, you know, 84 are conversing, conscious, alert, and oriented. They obviously don't need to be intubated. They don't need CPAP. They don't need anything. This is just a secondary effect of what's happening because of the COVID. So what's happening with the COVID is when you have this, well, there's two things happening with COVID. One is there's definitely a clotting pr uh, problem. So you've heard of these people who've had COVID, who've had strokes, who've had renal failure because they threw a clot to their kidneys, who've had heart attacks, even though they didn't have cardiac heart attacks, they still had a heart attack because of the clot that developed in their coronary arteries. So there's definitely a increase in the, in the risk of developing a clot, pulmonary embolisms, you know, and stuff like that, DVTs, um, secondary to COVID, okay? But then the other thing is happening from a respiratory component is when they have this cytokine storm is they're having what's called increased capillary permeability in their pulmonary capillaries. So where are your pulmonary capillaries? So obviously pulmonary is lungs, right? So your pulmonary capillaries are the network of capillaries that are wrapped around the alveoli. So you have your air sac and then wrapped completely around covering the entire air sac and also inside your air sac is a, a, a very diverse uh, system of capillaries. And the reason it's there obviously is that's where gas exchange takes place, right? So you're getting the oxygen coming into the alveoli by breathing and it's crossing over into the capillaries and being brought into the body. And then obviously the capillaries have the CO2 that needs to leave the body and that leaves the body by crossing over to the, um, from the capillaries into the alveoli and being exhaled. So you have this very, you know, diverse, uh, you know, robust system of capillaries. And we know capillaries are the smallest blood vessels, right? They're, they're single wall blood vessels, like paper thin, you know, blood vessels, like an onion skin type of thin, right? I mean, very, very paper thin. And um, the reason they're so thin is they have to have the ability to have what's called, um, sorry, I'm, I'm exhausted tonight. I have to have the ability to have, uh, not diffusion, not osmosis. Um, I can't remember the term for it. Well, the ability for the gases to exchange, right? So the ability for the gases to exchange between the alveoli and the capillaries. 
Now, if you increase the oh, permeability, so there we go, the term is permeability. So you've increased the permeability of the capillaries. So permeability relates to the ability to things to travel in and out of the capillaries. So when they have this cytokine storm, they greatly increase the permeability of those blood vessels. And what happens now is that the fluid portion of the blood, the plasma, flows out of the um, pulmonary capillaries and flows into the alveoli. So we know that the only thing that's supposed to be in the alveoli is air, right, is oxygen. So the, the issue would be is now if you have fluid flowing out of the blood vessels into the um, alveoli, you basically have pulmonary edema, right? You have like a dry, what they call a dry land drowning. So the person feels like they're drowning from the inside out, but there's no exposure to, you know, water, so to speak. So that's one of the things that's happening. And really putting them on a ventilator may help them oxygenate and ventilate, but they're still not dealing with the inflammatory issue. So they're finding the best treatment for these real sick COVID-19 patients is to put them on medications to suppress the inflammatory process. Now, the problem is when you suppress the inflammatory process, you also weaken the immune system. So now you make them more at risk for picking up a secondary pneumonia. So it's a, it's a very tough patient. But the ones where they've managed the inflammation part of it seem to have done better uh, in the short term and the long term, right? They're not getting the strokes, they're not getting the blood clots and stuff like that. Okay, so going back to this multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, right? So what happened is, you know, that they noticed about 30 to 45 days after there was a COVID-19 outbreak in a community that certain kids, not a lot of kids, but certain young kids under the age of 21, okay, even usually younger than that, you know, when they're in their, you know, say uh, young um, eight to, I don't know, 14 age group, you know, started getting sick. And how it first got noticed was the parents noticed or the kids were complaining that their toes had what looked like a fungal infection, like athlete's foot and stuff like that. And they were taking them to the pediatrician. And initially it was being thought that it was athlete's, athlete's foot, right? That it was a fungal infection. And then under closer examination, what's happening is because of the problem with the blood vessels clotting up and the decreased and the inflammation not letting enough blood, it was actually the skin breaking down because of the fact there wasn't good blood flow. And some of these kids were complaining about their hands being cold, their feet being cold, and, and stuff like that. So that's how it kind of started coming around. And that was one of the trademarks of Kawasaki disease. Uh, Kawasaki disease was a disease in the, the city of Kawasaki in, um, in Japan that uh, it's you know now spread through the whole world, but it was a kind of had similar symptoms. But you know, they didn't know the, the specific cause of it. They thought it might have been a viral type of exposure, which again, COVID is viral. But here they decided it's not Kawasaki and they named it this multi-system inflammatory syndrome because it affects more body parts, more body systems than Kawasaki did. The other thing in the beginning they thought was something called toxic shock syndrome. And that you may remember there was a, there was a period of time where we had a lot of cases with women and tampons women who left tampons in, you know, for a long period of time, were getting this bacterial infection and actually, you know, dying from, from sepsis. But again, this is more of a viral, not a bacterial. So they don't think it's toxic sock, sock syndrome, although it's shared some of the, uh, the characteristics. So with this multi-system inflammatory syndrome, most of the patients, most of the kids, okay, have either tested positive for COVID-19, okay, or were asymptomatic, they had no signs and symptoms of COVID-19, but when they did antibody testing, they tested positive for COVID-19. We, now we know kids are a big spreader because they're asymptomatic carriers, right? In kids, there's a lot of kids that have it that are what they call asymptomatic carriers. So they have no outward symptoms, but they are carriers of it and they were infecting other people, which is one of the fears of opening schools, right? Now you're gonna have you know, a lot of kids in there who could be asymptomatic carriers, no fever, no cough, no cold. So they're going to pass all the screening and they're going to introduce the COVID-19 into the school where there's going to be adults plus other kids that could then bring it home, become asymptomatic carriers and bring it home to their homes and stuff like that. Okay, so most of the cases seem to hit about 30 to 60 days after an area was hit with COVID-19. And that again is what happened in New York, right? It was about 45 to 60 days from the outbreak of COVID-19 when we started seeing this. It was really about a I guess a week, week and a half ago when you started seeing it now. Okay, uh, what's going on here? Okay, so we know in general, most kids have done very well with COVID, right? There hasn't been a lot of cases until this happened of COVID-19 in kids, okay? And, you know, very few kids who did get it needed to be hospitalized, okay? Now, what we had, again, about a week and a half, two weeks ago was they started these cases which started in pediatricians' offices. And because of a very robust 
um, screening process that the Department of Health in New York City, not New York State, the New York City Department of Health has this very robust uh, surveillance program. So whenever there's common symptoms showing, it gets reported to the Department of Health. And they do like a, a canvas of the pediatrician's offices, a canvas of the emergency departments and stuff like that to see if there's any common symptoms. And that's they look for these outbreaks. So they picked it up and obviously it's considered a novel um, syndrome, just like COVID-19 was a novel virus because we never saw it before. This is considered a novel syndrome because it was never seen before. And uh, you know they're speculating that obviously it has some um, not, not that it has some, but that it is related to COVID-19, okay? Okay, so, so the first case of this was reported in, in Britain, in the United Kingdom on April 26th, and it was first reported in New York City on 5-4. That was the first case. Um, now, this 145 cases and three deaths in New York State, that was as of 5-18. Now the cases are higher. There's over 200 cases. I couldn't find anything when I did a Google search today saying there were more deaths but there were definitely more cases, okay? And again, 90% of the kids tested positive for either having COVID at the, night, at the time they were being treated for this multi-system inflammatory syndrome or they had antibodies. The most common ages are one to 19. It was evenly distributed by gender and by race, okay? So there was no, you know, if it affects boys more than girls, you know, blacks more than whites, there was nothing uh, about that whatsoever. So pretty much evenly distributed. They were curious if it was going to affect Asians because Kawasaki tends to affect Asians more than anyone. But, um, you know, again, this is not Kawasaki, so there was no correlation to that. So this clinical criteria is what the New York State City Department of Health put up. And it's a little different than what the CDC and the State Department of Health put up, okay? So a child less than 21 years of age who has at least one day of subjective or measured fever. So subjective means they, you know, they felt, the, they themselves felt warm or feverish um, or they were flushed, okay? Or they actually took their temperature and it was above 100.4. 100.4, you know, as you know from the screening that we do is the, uh, you know, is the threshold for, you know, being febrile at this point. Now, the CDC, the state, they have seven days, okay? They have a seven-day window of fever. But the New York City said since pretty much, oh, and the other thing they took out, if you notice, they don't have anything that they had to be positive for COVID. The reason New York City took it out is they just assume everybody in New York City was either positive for COVID or has antibodies to COVID at this point. So again, you know, one-day history of fever, okay, and either at least one of the following. So hypertension shock, obviously, a late finding, okay? So these are the severe symptoms. So cardiogenic shock versus vasogenic shock. So cardiogenic shock obviously is shock related to a problem with the heart itself. And what happens here is that they get inflammation in their coronary arteries and they start to clot off their coronary arteries. So you know that a clot in a coronary artery is a heart attack, right? That's what we, when an adult has it, it's from a completely different syndrome, but here it's from the COVID-19 and the inflammatory process. So if you throw a clot and block off a coronary artery, especially if it's a coronary artery that supplies blood to the left ventricle, you know the left ventricle is the, you know, the, pumping, the pumping beast to the body. So if you, if you infarct the left ventricle, okay, and you can't pump effect, effectively into the aorta, you're, you go into shock. The other thing that happens if you, if you weaken your left ventricle is you also tend to go into um, pulmonary edema, right? So this is another issue they have with these patients. The reason why is if the left ventricle is supposed to pump into the aorta. So if it can't pump into the aorta, blood starts to back up, right? If you have a pump that can't pump forward and there's still fluid trying to circulate through the, blood, uh, through the pump, it starts to back up. So the left ventricle backs up into the left atrium and the left atrium pump, uh, backs up into the pulmonary vessels. And once you back up into the pulmonary vessels, you increase the pressure and those pulmonary capillaries start to leak. Okay, so, you know, that's the cardiogenic. The vasogenic is the blood vessel issue with it. And again, the inflammatory process tends to, you know, spasm the vessels, clot the vessels and stuff like that. So that's the two ways they tend to go into shock. With the uh, cardiac, they can get a secondary infection. A myocarditis is the, an infection in the actual myocardium or heart, heart muscle. A pericarditis is an infection of the sac surrounding the heart, the protective sac. A valvulitis is the valves between the atriums uh, and the ventricles and between the ventricles and the blood vessels they pump out into, either the, the pulmonary artery or the um, aorta. So and the problem when you get an infection in a, in a uh, valve is remember valves open and close. So every time the valve open and closes, it could have a little piece of infectious emboli break loose and travel. So now it, flo it flows down the bloodstream and spreads that infection to other places. 
they call it like micro infectious microemboli and stuff. Okay. And what they found with these patients that came in, you know, with these pediatric patients is that they actually had all the signs and symptoms of a heart attack. Okay, so they had the elevated tromponin levels, which again was the, you know, when we take a patient, EMS takes a patient to the hospital with a, you know, a suspected heart attack. So one thing they look at is the 12 lead EKG, but we know that there's many people who have heart attacks who do not have abnormal 12 leads right away, especially if they call very quickly, right? They may have not have abnormal EKGs. The other, the, the real marker is this tromponin level. Tromponin is an enzyme that's given off when a muscle is bru bruised. So if you did CrossFit and I measured your tromponin levels, it would be elevated, okay? So like if, if you, I don't know, if you wanted to, you know, I don't want to say do a gag, but if you wanted to do like a, uh, see, see if you get admitted to the hospital pretending to have a heart attack and you really don't, like you know you're not having a heart attack. If you went to the, if you worked out really hard, I mean, I'm talking seriously hard, okay? And you uh, went to the um, hospital and said you're having chest pain and maybe you splash some cold water on yourself to make yourself look diaphoretic and everything. You know, your, your EKG would probably be okay, but when they ran your tromponin levels, it would be elevated. So they would still have to send you up to the cardiac cath lab and have you have your coronary arteries catheterized to look to see if there's any blockage because of that elevated tromponin level. In fact, there's people who do CrossFit that actually have something called rhabdomyolysis, which is a dangerous acidosis develops in the body from muscle breakdown. So, you know, you know, when you exercise, you're supposed to have like a day off or at least, you know, relax a certain, you know, work a muscle group one day and then relax it the next day. So sometimes when these people do CrossFit, they do everything, right? If you ever saw a CrossFit type of exercise or, or session, they do almost every body part. And if they do it day in and day out, they can actually, there's cases where people have actually, you know, died from what they call rhabdomyolysis, which really you kind of see more in building collapses when there's pressure on the body and the, the muscles can't get blood, they start to break down. In this case, they're breaking it down because of this, the serious exercise and stuff. So again, in this situation, there's kids who are actually having heart attacks. So this is a, a, a sad situation where the kid could survive this multi-system inflammatory syndrome, but be a cardiac cripple, right? So they could, for the rest of their lives, have have had you know, significant cardiac damage where they may need an LVAD, they may need to be put on a transport list, they may need supplemental oxygen to get through the day. So it's one of the issues. And that was also similar with Kawasaki syndrome. There were kids who developed the same thing. They threw clots in their coronary arteries. Now, besides the heart, it can really involve any other organ. Okay, so there's kids who you know, are having strokes from this. There's kids who are having renal failure from this. Um, you know, so there's a lot of different, and again, just depends on where the blood vessels are getting inflamed. Okay. Now the things that we're going to see, right, because we're probably not going to get the kids in this state because no, no parent is going to let the kids stay home to the point where they get this significantly ill. So we're probably going to pick up these more, you know, early symptoms. So this macro uh, popular, popular rash, I'll show you what it looks like, bilateral non-purulent conjunctivitis. So you've all seen conjunctivitis, right? The pink eye, well, you've seen it where it's infectious and it oozes and it weeps. In this case, since it's not really infectious, it's actually just the blood vessels getting inflamed, right? You know, if you've seen somebody when they're tired and their blood vessels get all inflamed and stuff, it's the same thing. Um, you know, there's no um, oozing of any kind of infectious substance. So that's why it's non-purulent. Okay, the mucocutaneous inflammatory signs, you'll see they get what's called a strawberry tongue. Um, and I'll show you again pictures of what it looks like. And then it really, actually one of the earlier things is the stomach. They get diarrhea, vomiting, abdominal pain, severe, severe abdominal pain uh, with it. So those probably more what we're gonna get called for. And we may get you know false calls because obviously parents are scrutinizing all the information that's out there and their kid could just get a GI you know, type of, of uh, virus. And they're right away going to think it's this. And I'm not saying I wouldn't, as a parent, be overly cautious because, you know, it is it is definitely uh, a situation. Now, just for us, we should still be wearing full PPE, right? I mean, nobody should be going and assessing patients without full PPE. Now, does the whole crew have to get into full PPE? No. Who's ever going to go in and find out what's going on on a call, whether it's uh, this pediatric syndrome or but any pretty much any call you're going on? who's ever gonna go in and find out what's going on has to have full PPE, right? They have to have at least an N95 mask. They have to have eye protection, okay? They have to have um, gloves on and probably, you know, a gown, at, you know, at a minimum. So the same thing with these kids. They, you know, when you're going to check these kids, the parents could say to you, oh, they had a COVID-19 test, they were negative. 
you still have to wear PPE because they could be asymptomatic carriers. Or for all you know, there could be parents that are, you know, carriers, you know, because they've been around the kid and they've been infected and not showing any, you know, overt signs yet or anything like that. We had a patient that was in a um, dock in a box. Um, she had chest pain. She thought it was COVID-19 for breathing and all this stuff. She actually had a heart attack. Now, it could have been this COVID-19 type of thing. Back then, we didn't know about it. And she was an adult. Actually, you know, she was in her, in her late 60s. Um, but she, she te wound up testing positive for COVID-19. Her husband was positive for COVID-19 because it came in as a heart attack at a urgent care where, you know, they figured they knew for sure she was having an urgent care. They didn't wear any PPE. So now they transported this lady and her husband in the ambulance with no PPE on anyone except gloves. And uh, it comes back that they were both positive for COVID-19. So everybody on the crew, medics, EMTs, everybody had to be quarantined for two weeks. Okay. So let's look at um, some other symptoms, and then we'll look at some pictures. This is the CDC um, signs and symptoms, okay? So they talk about, you know, prolonged fever for more than five days, which again, this New York City one, they only have one day. Difficulty feeding of infants too sick to drink fluids. Severe abdominal pain, diarrhea, and vomiting. Changes in skin color. Again, that's the lack of circulation in the blood vessels, okay? Pale, patchy, or blue. Trouble breathing okay, or breathing fast, having tachypnea, rapid breathing, racing heart or chest pain, decreased amount of urine, which is secondary to obviously not bringing in enough fluids, lethargy, irritability, and confusion, okay. Now, the biggest role we're going to play in this is we really have no treatment role in this. The biggest role we're going to play in this is recognizing and appropriate transport. So, these patients really belong in a multi-specialty pediatric hospital. So, for us, it's going to be Hackensack or Westchester. In saying that, our hospitals, Good Sam and Nyack, are starving for patients. I don't know if you've been there lately, but they're starving for patients. So what they told us is they would like us, unless it's very, very obvious signs or a previous diagnosis of this multi-system inflammatory, they would like us to bring them to their hospitals and they'll make the decision of where they need to go to. Now, the problem with that is that when you bring a patient to a community hospital and they recognize it needs to be transferred, you've probably delayed that patient's care, you know, four to six hours, right? I mean, they, they're going to be transported from South Orange Town to Nyack. Nyack is going to take at least an hour, maybe more to figure out what they want to do. Then they have to call Westchester, or in their case, Nyack would be Montefiore, get an accepting physician. That could literally take an hour or two. And then they have to arrange transport. So, you know, officially, I would say we're supposed to take them to Nyack or, you know, a good Sam, but, you know, unofficially, I would say that if you recognize there's a risk that this could be this multi-system inflammatory syndrome, make sure you have full PPE on. And what I always say, you know, when a patient, the family says, well, you know, where do you think we should go? I'll say to them, well, we do not have a hospital in Rockland County that has a pediatric intensive care unit. So if your child has to be admitted, you know, they're going to transport them to a different hospital that has a pediatric intensive care unit. So maybe you would want them to go to that type of hospital first, you know, and then they'll say, well, what type of hospital is that? You know, where is that? And then you could say Westchester, Hackensack, Montefiore, Columbia, you know, again, I don't know where you guys would be willing to go to. I wouldn't put out, you know, I wouldn't put out a hospital that you're not willing to transport to. Okay, so that's probably our biggest role that we would, you know, put these patients, do for these patients to improve their outcome. Okay, so let's look at some of the stuff that they have. So this is the strawberry tongue. So they basically get a very inflamed red tongue that has white bumps on it. Okay, again, totally because of, it's not uh, a allergic reaction or anything like that. It's just totally the inflammation going on in the body. Now, normally with that, you're going to see that their lips become red and cracked. And that's, again, the lack of perfusion right, to your distal areas, to your furthest part out. So you see here, tongue is getting dried now. The lips look like they're, you know, it looks like a winter type of lip where it's all dried out and everything. That is, again, this, you know, multi-system inflammatory syndrome, this lack of blood getting to the very distal parts of the body, okay? This was a picture of a kid a couple days, I'm sorry, a couple weeks post. So now this tongue is starting to heal and the skin Again, because of lack of blood flow, you could see the skin is actually sloughing off, right? So it almost looks like a frostbite. And that was one of the things besides the fungal infection that they first thought was that, you know, could these kids be actually having some type of cold exposure type of situation, which, you know, obviously this time of the year would be pretty, pretty rare unless they were immersed in cold water. 
This is a non-purulent conjunctivitis, so it's pretty, you know, pretty obvious. Okay. This is a mucocutaneous inflammatory syndrome. Now, a lot of people ask me, you know, well, how would we tell the difference between looking at this and looking at an anaphylaxis, right? So anaphylaxis does have hives. This does look like it could be hives, okay? But anaphylaxis doesn't have all the other things we just looked at, right? You're not going to see that those cracked lips. You're not going to see that strawberry tongue. You know, you're not going to see a conjunctivitis in anaphylaxis. So in anaphylaxis, there's also a history, right? There's probably a history of allergic reactions. It could be the first time, but most of the times there's a history. And there's probably some story of ingesting something that they're allergic to. So in this situation, you know, it, this could hit a kid out of left field with no illness, right? If this was an asymptomatic carrier, it could be all of a sudden that, you know, he develops this rash and stuff like that. And that's why they're calling you. Okay, this is the macu uh, popular papular uh, rash that develops on them, back, stomach, arms. You know, so it's pretty much all over. Again, not infect, not infectious, not um, anaphylaxis. This is just the inflammatory process that's going on in the body. Now, one of the things that happens again because of the fluid leaking out of blood vessels in in the boys and young boys is their testicles get very swollen and inflamed. Not everyone, but. And this is extremely, extremely painful. They have problems urinating, okay? And, um, you know, just another, you know, sign and symptom, okay? And then the lymph, the, your lymphatic system, which you know is, you know, part of your immune system. So your lymph nodes that produce the lymph that uh, has the antibodies to fight infection, when they have to go into overdrive, they get swollen, right? When they go into overdrive to fight infection, they get swollen. So in this case, in the smaller kids, their, their necks look like they have double chins. They get all swollen and everything from the lymph nodes that are in their neck and uh, the back of their head and stuff like that get all swollen. So that's uh, you know, another um, sign and symptom you would see. Oh, just letting somebody else in. Okay, so that's basically the signs and symptoms. Let me just go back and we could take one more look at it and then I'll open it up for questions. Okay, so tongue, okay, along with lips, or it could be either or, I gotta be honest with you. I mean, technically, you know, it doesn't have to be both simultaneously. I'm sure the lips take much longer to get to this point, okay? So skin, toes, and hands with the skin breaking down. Um, it can look like blisters. You know, it can, um, you know, before it breaks, breaks apart like this, it can look like blisters, okay? The non-purulent conjunctivitis, okay? The the macular, or, uh, mucocutaneous, um, and this is, this is the same thing that happens, um, you know, the inflammation. So like when you have hives from an, an infectious standpoint, it's basically your capillaries leaking fluid, okay? And in that case, it's because of the histamine that's released in an allergic reaction. In this case, it's because of the cytokine that's released because of the inflammatory process. So, I mean, the ultimate endpoint is the same. They get what looks like hives, but the etiology of why it happens is different, okay? The rash, okay? So, you know, they say if you have two of these, Along with a fever, that would be enough to consider it being multi-system inflammatory syndrome. Now, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't dazzle the parents with terms and stuff like that, but you should just say, you know, you've probably heard about this situation with kids. It's probably better safe than sorry that we get them over to a, um, you know, a pediatric uh, level hospital. And the closest one for us would be Westchester or Hackensack. Okay. So that's basically everything. I'm going to unmute everybody for a second and see, does anybody have any questions on that part of it. Can you explain the cervical lymphadenopathy again? I missed it. No, so you know your lymphatic system, right, is what right. fights infection. So right. just like when you had strep throat, right, you had swollen glands. So it's the same, same basic thing. Whenever you have an infection in your body, your lymphatic system goes into overdrive, okay? And when it goes into overdrive, they get swollen. So that's all it is. It's nothing. It's just a, oh, okay. a normal, a normal infectious uh, response. So nothing, um, you know, nothing, nothing that you know. I guess maybe just because it's happening in smaller kids, it's much more obvious. But you know, you you've seen swollen glands and you know kids all the time, your own kids and stuff. So. Right. Okay. Okay. So any questions? Has anybody had had a patient or saw anything with this yet? So like I said, we, we, have had, um, we have had this in Rockland County. Um, just uh, last, I think Thursday or Friday, we transported a pretty sick kid down to Montefiore from Nyack. 
Um, he did not come in via EMS. He came in via the parents to the emergency room. And he, um, you know, but he was considered to be, you know, again, there's, there's about 15 different uh, blood tests they do to make the definitive diagnosis. So, I don't, you know, he wasn't at NIAC long enough to have that um, diagnosis, but, um, you know, diagnosis made, but they shipped him with that sus high suspicion. He had the rash, he had the lips, he had the eyes, you know, he had everything, um, but he was early. So he wasn't in shock or anything like that. So in that case, you know, that was good. So. Okay. Um, How long yeah. does that take to progress from start to finish? A so, couple of days, a couple of weeks? No. So, so in the stuff from the city, like the first couple of cases in the city, they said it was less than five days from the onset of symptoms to them getting pretty sick. Um, okay. So, yeah, it was pretty quick. Um, so, but I haven't seen, you know, there's really not a lot out there yet. You know, the, they don't want to panic people or anything like that. So there's not a lot out there. Um, the, the, the two biggest sites I've seen is, you know, the CDC under the professional side has some stuff on it. And the American Academy of Pediatricians has a, uh, like a sub site on their website with information on it and stuff like that. Okay. So the other two things that we're going to talk about today is mental health of the EMT, which is a new section that none of us have ever had before, had to do before for the CME program and then psychiatric emergencies. So Hold on one second. Um, the, uh, you know, the mental health of the EMT. So I, I'm not, I have to be honest with you, I'm not an expert, you know, in, in that. And I'll just tell you that I've seen a lot of people uh, become unhinged over this COVID-19. And the interesting thing was, it wasn't the amount of deaths. It wasn't anything like that. It was when we told them that they could not do their regular treatment of a patient, right? So we told them at some point that we weren't doing CPAP anymore. We weren't doing nebulizers anymore because those procedures are considered high risk for aerosol generating um, virus you know, spreading. And the only way you could do them safely is if you have um, a viral filter to put on the end of those devices. So we went into the pandemic with like 150 viral filters because you know that's normally what we kept around for when we had patients on vents and stuff like that that were um, you know infectious. Once we exhausted those, we told them they could no longer do nebulizers or CPAP because they'd be putting themselves and everybody else at risk, even with PPE. And the hospitals basically told us that if you know we came in with a patient on a nebulizer they were gonna have a fit and stuff like that. So we started telling people to back off the treatment. Then it came out with the, I'm, I'm sure you remember all the cardiac arrest algorithms, right? We were basically, unless the patient dropped in front of us, we weren't working them. And if we were working them, we were working them for a very short time, right? If they were a V-fib arrest and we shocked them, they went into a systole, we were pronouncing them. So it was everything different than we you know, ever did before. And that's when people started becoming unhinged. Uh, people were saying, you know, this is not why I got into this profession. You know, I, I mean, I want to help people. I want to try to save them. And you're telling us, you know, not to treat them. You know, I can't give my asthma patient a nebulizer. I can't give this. I can't, you know. And yeah, you couldn't because of the risk to not only the, you know, you, you the care provider, but, you know, everybody else that was in that ambulance, everybody that was in that emergency room, if you came in when that patient was on it. So that's when we really started having people become unhinged. And I'm talking crying you know, feeling like they couldn't work anymore and stuff like that. So, you know, it was interesting, right? Because I, to me, the fact, I mean, I walked into a assisted living here. Uh, I backed up a solo medic going on a, you know, a possible cardiac arrest at assisted living around the corner from here. And uh, we walked down the hallway, not knowing what room it was in. There were nine dead people that nobody knew about. Nine dead people. So, you know, I thought if anything, somebody would get unhinged over that, right? That, you know, the, the staff was not checking on the patients because they didn't have their enough PPE. And over a course of a weekend, you know, nine people died. And, um, you know, they died, no family, no nothing. Nobody knew they were dead. The family couldn't come in and see them. So to me, I thought that, you know, that was what kind of troubled me a little more. But for most of my guys and, and girls, it was, the, it was the fact that we kind of handcuffed them and told them they couldn't do their normal treatment. So I don't know, you know, what happened at SOAC and how people felt about it and everything like that, but that was the, the issue. Um, and then, of course, you know, our normal mechanism to have people coping, which would be, you know, to have some kind of peer, peer counseling and stuff like that, we couldn't do, right? We couldn't, uh, we couldn't do that because there was no more face-to-face. -face, so everything was supposed to be by Zoom and stuff like that. So, it, you know, it, it definitely... Um, you know, it definitely took a toll on people. And we know there was that, pe that younger pediatric 
I'm sorry, younger emergency department physician, female physician in New York City who took her life, you know, because she couldn't deal with what was going on. So, you know, I think there's definitely going to be more awareness of mental health of, you know, healthcare providers than there was before. Um, you know, what it's, what's going to come of it, I don't know. You know, I don't know. Um, I found that, you know, previous to this, to this COVID-19, that like, let's say we had a pediatric death, you know, whatever, car accident, kid died. You know, we, we got everybody together to talk about it. The people who wanted to talk about, you know, how hard they tried and, and you know, everything they did great and stuff like that, where the people tended to go. And the people who were affected by it were the ones who tended to um, not go. So it was very hard to get those people to, you know, want to go. Um, so I don't know. What do people what do people feel about that? I got to figure out how to mute. I hear Pete in the background, I think. Uh, for two hours, right? <laughs> Hold on. I have no idea. I think he lies about <laughs> Who's that? Is that Pete? That's Wayne. Wayne? Wayne, you're too loud. I can't find <laughs> Wayne anymore. Uh, I can't find a list of people. Let me disappear. <clears throat> Let's see. Meeting controls. Oh, here we go. Okay. So what did you guys experience, um, you know, as far as mental health and the EMT type of things with this? Nothing. Nobody had any issues. Okay. Um, the county does have a team. I'm not exactly sure, you know, the credentials of people that are on it and stuff like that, but the county definitely does have a team. Um, we also have the behavioral health response team here, you know, that has social workers and um, I think they have one mental health nurse that's available. Again, most of it's being done by telephone, um, but, you know, you should recognize it. I mean, you know, who would have thought that, that that physician would have taken our life, you know, over this. Okay. Now, the other thing I want to talk to you about from a psychiatric standpoint that I think pertains more to what we do um, is the, what they call um, sudden death in custody. In other words, a, a somebody we are restraining or the police are restraining who goes into cardiac arrest. And you've, you know, you've heard about this, you read about this. There was that case out in Staten Island, that famous case, you know, where the guy was selling loose cigarettes and they, they decided to arrest him and the process, he resisted, I guess, in the process of getting arrested, he went into respiratory arrest and died. So this is not an uncommon thing, okay? So we're gonna talk about a little bit of the different things. And what really happens with most of these patients, they go into this state of called excited delirium. Now, the only reason I think it's important for us to know about it is in that case in Staten Island, um, you know, when the EMS showed up, it was Staten Island University Hospital paramedics and EMTs that showed up, two different, and an ALS ambulance and a BLS ambulance showed up. And they basically showed these people standing around with their hands in their pockets, joking with the cops, while this guy was laying on the ground saying, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Um, now, understanding that, you know, they probably assumed the guy was violent, which is why the cops restrained him and, you know, and everything like that. But the long and short is that the hospital settled without ever getting sued. They just wrote a check. When the video surfaced of, you know, the paramedics and EMT standing around kind of joking and doing nothing for this guy who's saying, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, they just, you know, they knew there was no defending what was done. Now, we've gone on these calls where the police have had to handcuff people, people have been violent, and it's hard to tell the difference between somebody who, you know, does need to be restrained because they're a danger to us, but that same person could go into, you know, excited delirium and stop breathing. So this is the situation. So I'll just tell you a couple things that we could look for and a couple things we could do to help prevent that from happening in the patient. Okay, so we're going to talk about this excited delirium and a couple other things that, you know, ha happen with it. Okay, so the term sudden, you know, sudden in custody death is a new thing, right? That somebody dying in, in the process of being restrained. Um, it doesn't just happen to the police. It happens in hospitals with psychiatric patients and stuff like that. It's happened in um juvenile group homes where they had kids acting, acting out and everything like that. So, um, you know, but the lecture was more geared towards it being, you know, the, somebody that the uh, police uh, had arrested and stuff like that. Okay. So obviously whenever the police are involved, it sounds like it's always brutality and stuff like that. And, you know, sometimes it is right. Sometimes it definitely is, but again, you don't know what they were facing 
you know, prior to restraining this guy. So it's kind of hard to, you know, second day, uh, you know, quarterback type of thing. Okay, so we'll talk about excited delirium. Okay, we're going to talk about the type of patient that's most at risk for having this, how alcohol and drug plays a role in it. Okay, the use of physical restraints, which, you know, we know we transport patients that the police have restrained. Okay, and once, you know, once you're involved in it, you know, you are, you know, guilty by association. We'll talk about the use of mace and other chemical restraints and whether it plays a role or not. Okay, so the bad part about this is usually there's no warning, right? So these are people that were very violent, were restrained, now are quiet, and we have to tell the difference that they're quiet because they're cooperating and quiet because, or, or versus quiet because they're dying. Right, so that's the situation. And at the same token, we have to protect ourselves, right? We don't want to get spit on. We don't want to get assaulted or anything like that. Okay, so we'll talk about, you know, how to tell the difference and stuff. So when I talk about excited delirium, so the first thing we have to just talk about is what's delirium versus excited delirium. So you've all gone to the delirious patient, right? The patient who has lost kind of touch with what's going on and stuff like that. So, you know, hallucinations, okay, delusions. They think they're, you know, they think they're Donald Trump they're, or they're seeing the, you know, elephant walking down the street and stuff like that, that's delirium. Most of the times delirium has a medical background, right? Has some type of medical background to it, okay? Sometimes it's strictly psychiatric, but a lot of times it has, which is why we transport all our psychiatric patients to a medical hospital first to get medically cleared before they go to a psychiatric hospital, okay? Um, substance abuse about 20% of the times, and it could also be substance withdrawal, right? It could be that, you know, you give somebody Narcan. It could be that this is an alcoholic who's trying to come clean and they go into the DTs, the delirium tremors and stuff like that. So there's a lot of different things behind it. But most of the cases of these patients who passed away, they go into the state of called excited delirium, okay? Which is that they become very, very, very agitated. And you see down here at the bottom, it has heightened sympathetic stimulation. So you probably remember a little bit that you have a, a nervous system in your body called the autonomic nervous system. So autonomic sounds like automatic. It's the, the system that runs without any, um, you know, any conscious decision on your part, right? It's what keeps you alive when you're sleeping, so to speak. So there's two divisions to it. There's the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. And sympathetic, you know, as the fight or flight syndrome, right? So sympathetic is when adrenaline is released into your bloodstream because you are scared, frightened, and something like that. And it's kind of speeds everything up, right? So it puts you into what's called a hyperdynamic state. So what does it do? If adrenaline is released into your bloodstream, you know you become tachycardic, you become, you become tachypnic, which means you breathe very quickly, your blood pressure increases, okay? And then you have some other things that happen, you know, your, your vision, your, your night vision improves, your peripheral vision improves, all things designed to keep you alive. But that's not what happens to, um, you know, in these patients, it's more that their blood pressure shoots up, their pulse shoots up, and their breathing gets very quick. Okay. Now, the other thing that tends to happen with them is they get very hot. And depending if they have certain drugs on board, they can get hot enough to actually have heat stroke without being in a hot environment, right? So you could walk, this could be the winter time, and you touch this guy and he's burning up. That's this excited delirium. So most of these patients who die from excited delirium, okay, are dying because of this sympathetic stimulation, this over sympathetic stimulation that's happening. Okay, so again, there's usually some agitation. There may be some paranoia, right? They're usually aggressive. They do have great strength. And obviously, the harder they fight, the harder the police fight, right, to restrain them, or maybe we're involved with it too. And the interesting thing is that they, they have this numbness, numbness to pain, right? So they, they do not feel, um, you know, the, the pain of the handcuffs, the pain of the being forced down and everything like that. So that's, and they fight against it. So the more they fight against it, the more everybody else escalates it, okay? So, you know, why do we care? We care because when, you know, if we're there, the, you know, one of the answers the police are going to have is that, well, EMS was there to take care of that patient. You know, we turned over the care of that patient to EMS. And so now it's kind of our responsibility. So yes, they may have been the precipitating cause of what was happening, but once we get there, it's expected that, you know, we should be able to manage this. Now, you have to make sure you have good documentation of what you were told, you weren't told. Do you remember there was probably, I don't know, a couple months back, there was somebody who was tasered in Spring Valley and died. They, they, it was only out in the newspaper for a day or two, and then they kind of hushed it up. When, the, when EMS showed up, they never told us that the patient was tasered. They said we were arresting him, and he became unconscious. Never said he was being, that he was tasered. 
And then when the, the, the bystanders started talking about, you know, they shocked him, they shocked him. That's when the medic said, was he tasered? And they, the cops looked at each other and then they said, oh yeah, he was. So now did the tasering have anything to do? We don't know because it, nothing came out, right? There was no report on the autopsy, you know, nothing made it to the newspaper. So nobody knows exactly what happened. Maybe it will come out, but you have to remember in these cases, the, the police are there, you know, police are there to kind of protect themselves too, right? They're not going to incriminate themselves and when this happened. So you have to be very careful to try to gather as much information, try to find out what happened so that you, you know, don't wind up holding the bag at the end of the day. Okay. So again, what happens in excited delirium is you have your two sympathetic hormones, epinephrine and norepinephrine, have increased uh, release. Okay. The vagal stimulation, um, it's actually should probably say decreased vagal stimulation, but the, the vagal stimulation is the opposite of the sympathetic. It's the parasympathetic. So that's why sometimes you'll see they have like a dry mouth and stuff like that. Okay. So adrenergic stimulation is again, the epinephrine and norepinephrine. Now the increased myocardial excitability. So, you know, the myocardial is the heart. So the increased myocardial excitability has to do with the fact that the heart now is being strained. And that's why some of these people have cardiac arrest, right? That's why some of these people just suddenly, you know, drop dead. Okay. Now, as far as what patients are most at risk, most of the times it's over 40. Most of the times they are heavy. Okay. They don't have to be grossly morbidly obese, but they are heavy. Okay. Most of them have some pre existing medical condition, whether it be high blood pressure, you know, diabetes or asthma. Okay. Most of them do have some pre existing me medical conditions. And most of the times there is substance abuse involved. Now, in the midst of a criminal arrest, I've got to figure this is going to be a pretty crazy scene. Are you going to be able to know everything about this? No, but you can definitely see if they look a little older, are they heavy and stuff like that. You're probably not going to be able to find out about the last three. Okay. Because they're probably not going to be, you know, so cooperative and talking to you and stuff like that. Okay. Now how do substances play a role? Okay. So alcohol plays a role. Okay. In a couple different ways. Okay. One is the withdrawal where they could go into what they call the DTs, delirium tremors, where they really, you know, um, get quite agitated and um, are suffering, okay? Um, it could be just when they're drunk, they, ha you know, they're having altered mental status, they're not following commands, that, you know, they're more at risk for falls and stuff like that. People that are long-term alcoholics, their brain actually shrinks a little bit. So when they do fall and hit their head, they tend to have more bleeding in their cranium before they have signs and symptoms, right? So if you had a alcoholic that had a... Um, an epidural hematoma and a non-alcoholic uh, non epi epidural hematoma, you would see the signs and symptoms quicker on a non-alcoholic because their brain is full size. So if their brain is full size, the swelling will occur quicker because the brain is filling up most of the cranial cavity. In an alcoholic, because there's brain shrinkage, there's more room for bleeding to occur. So you won't see the swelling. You know, you won't see the signs and symptoms, the Cushing's triad, the hypertension, the bradycardia and stuff as easy. The same thing in small kids, right? Because they have a soft cranium, they tend to show the symptoms later, which is obviously more dangerous because the quicker you pick up on the symptoms, the quicker you can suspect what's going on in the body. Now, the two big ones drug-wise, okay, would be cocaine was one, right? So in cocaine, okay, they are tend to have very, very high temperatures, right? It's that whole thermoregulation issue, okay? They're obviously agitated. They already have the delirium. They're also at risk for this rhabdomyolysis, which is that what we were talking about before where the muscle starts to break down and they become very, very acidotic. And when the body, you know, we, you think of uh, acidosis as kind of when you see somebody checking the pool, you know, to see the water and they're putting the, the a little bit of water and they're putting some dyes in to see how it turns color and then they're deciding which chemical. So that's trying to maintain acid base balance in the pool. So our body maintains our own acid base balance. And when you go into this state of rhabdomyolysis, you become very, very acidotic. And we cannot live in an acidotic state. Our, our pH balance, our, our measurement of our acidity versus our alkalinity is 7.35 to 7.45. So it's a 0.10 range. And really outside of that, it starts to become incompatible with life. So if you have a patient who's you know, being restrained and they're very agitated and they're developing this rhabdomyolysis, which again, takes a while, okay, um, they can go into cardiac arrest just from an acidosis, right? And they're most at risk for this sudden death, okay? Okay. Now, people who are, are abusing cocaine, okay, usually they don't have, I'm sorry, abusing cocaine and have the excited delirium. They usually don't have the tachypnea, the rapid breathing 
okay, that you would expect to see in someone who was fighting, right? So you may say, oh, look, they're not breathing so hard, so there's no big risk. But if they were a co cocaine abuser, for some reason in this cocaine abuse, they, they tend not to have the tachypnea. Okay, they also tend to have a normal body temperature and they tend not to perspire. So everything you would normally think you would see in somebody who's fighting, you don't see. So you would be lulled into a sense of, um, you know, uh, safety. Okay. Now, what really kills them, right? So the excited delirium itself is dangerous. What really kills them is when they're forced face down, okay, and restrained in that position. And that term is now called positional asphyxia. So there's no way, shape, or form that you can transport a patient face down in an ambulance anymore. Okay. It just doesn't happen. Years ago, we did it, but you cannot transport a patient face down anymore. So if you're afraid that they're going to spit on you, put a non-rebreather on them, put a surgical mask on them, whatever you want to do, but you cannot transport a patient face down. The reason why is that when they're face down and they have this excited delirium, it's very, very hard to breathe. Okay. I mean, just yourself, you know, just think when you were kids and everybody was piling on somebody, right? You know, you're doing that. Everybody's jumping on somebody. The person that was on the bottom with everybody laying on top of them panicked, right? Because they couldn't breathe. And they got a lot of times this superhuman strength and was able to break free and throw everybody off. So in this situation, they're physically being restrained face down, sometimes handcuffed and restrained, even hogtied and restrained. Okay. And they stop breathing. You know, that's exactly what happens. I guess the weight on their chest makes it very difficult for them to expand their lungs, expand their chest and breathe. Because the way we have gas exchange is we change the diameter of our thorax, of our chest. So when we're breathing in, our muscles of our rib cage contract and pull our ribs out and our diaphragm goes down and it increases the size of your thoracic cavity. And if you increase the size of the thoracic cavity, the pressure inside goes down, right? If the, if the cavity itself is bigger, there has to be less pressure inside. And that allows air to flow in. And then to exhale, the muscles relax, so it decreases the size of the cavity and the pressure increases because the cavity is smaller. So when there's pressure on their chest, especially if they're obese, they cannot do this, right? There's a video out there of a, I think she was like 30 year old woman in an airport um, it, out west somewhere where she was bumped from her flight. And she freaked out over the fact that she was bumped from her flight and got very agitated, started screaming and yelling and they called the cops. The cops came and she, they told her to calm down, you know, where she was going to be arrested. She started screaming and yelling. I think she pushed one of them. So they moved to arrest her. She, she fought back and they basically got her down on the ground. She was fighting, fighting. And all of a sudden she, you know, in the video, you, you see her stop fighting. So it looks to like everybody that she, you know, uh, agreed to be handcuffed. They, after they handcuffed her, they, they started to pull her into an upright position and you saw her head was slumped down and she wasn't, you know, she wasn't bearing her own weight. They tried to stand her up. She collapsed back down. They thought she was just playing games. They were like, you know, cooperate, cooperate. And she was dead. So that's why she wasn't standing back up. And in her case, she was an asthmatic. She was thin. She was an asthmatic. And she probably died from bronchospasm. Okay. So again, positional asphyxia, face down, can't happen anymore. Okay. It just cannot happen. If they're so violent that you're afraid to put them on their back, they have to at least be on their side, right? In the laterally recumbent position and stuff like that. Again, it's somehow interfering with the action of the chest muscles moving air. Okay, so the patients tend to have a high CO2 level, which will sedate them, make them appear quiet, okay, and then a low O2 level. So both of those will quickly uh, contribute to their dying, okay. Now, restraint asphyxia talks about, and I, I've never seen this done, but I guess there are some police departments that do like the hog tie type of thing. So they're handcuffed, and then it's attached, their, their, and their feet are, are, are secured, and then they're all attached together. So they say in that case, that's the quickest way, right? Because they're in that prone position. And I guess the combination of having your arms behind you, okay, and, uh, you know, you can't lift your chest. And then they were also talking about something with the neck, right? The neck flexed towards the chest plays a role in, you know, not being able to breathe. So there's just no way if the cops are refusing to, to at least, you know, take away, uh, let me go back, take away the restraint between the feet and the hands and let the feet go down, then I don't know, you might have to, uh, you might have to call their bluff and say, then we're not transporting, you know, we're not transporting them in this position. Um, because, you know, there's just no safe way. And there's probably no safe way, you know, really to get them onto the stretcher and secure them in this position. Okay, so chemical restraints, there is some cases where the, the, the capsum, the, um, the pepper spray has caused people to have breathing problems secondary to, you know, a chemical irritant in their lungs, like an asthma attack or, a, 
you know, a, a laryngeal spasm where their, their larynx starts to spasm and stuff like that, but not that much, but that, that is possible. Okay. Now, what do we do for them? So we need to be there early, right? Now the responsibility shifts to us. Okay. We need to make sure that we get them on their side or on their back as quick as possible. Try to gather as much information as you can of what happened, you know, with a grain of salt that you may not be told, telling the, uh, being told the exact truth and stuff like that. Okay. And then monitor the patient for any signs of, you know, the, the fact they're going into distress. Okay. Now, one of the issues we have, right, is, is the patient being quiet because they're having a, a medical problem or is the patient being quiet to trick us into, you know, trying to release them from their restraints and then become combative again and stuff like that. So I would never get to the point where you completely take the restraints off them unless you truly know the patient is coded. In other words, if they're in V-fib, they're in asystole, you know, they're truly coded, then you could ask the police to take the restraints off. Um, the problem with taking the restraints off is if they're, if, you know, if they're just faking you and now you've taken the restraints off, you're going to have a, you know, a violent situation on your hands. Okay, decontamination from chemical restraints ASAP. So there's no real way of decontaminating somebody's airway, right? So in other words, if they got it on their face and it's bothering them, that's one thing. You could, you know, take some water, wipe them down. The cops usually have the wipes to, um, you know, wipe them down with. I don't know what's on those wipes, but somehow it inactivates the pepper part of it. Um, but if it's in their airway, there's no real way to, you know, decontaminate their airway with that. So it would just would have to be trying to manage their airway as best you can. Okay. You want the patient to be preferably on their back, if not on their side. It doesn't matter left or right side. Okay. okay. And then the patient has to be constantly monitored, okay, all the way to the hospital. And if they get quiet, you're going to have to try to figure out, are they getting quiet because they're getting worse? Or are they getting quiet because, you know, they're just calmed down a little bit? Okay. So we need to know how to recognize, okay. We need to know, well, that's more for the police. In other words, to get us there to manage the patient. Okay. We try not to escalate the situation. Now, you know that there are, unfortunately, some very young EMTs out there, you know, future wannabe cops and stuff like that that tend to aggravate the situation and stuff. They're not the people to have, you know, in this. You want the, the older, calmer, you know, um, people that can kind of talk to people and maybe talk them down from that situation. Um, you know, the BERT team is a resource. The problem with the BERT team is that by the time they get there, a lot of times, you know, it takes so long that you just want to get going, but, you know, you may be able to get a resource and stuff like that. Okay, if you can contain the behavior rather restrain the behavior, because the restraint definitely has a, a problem to it. But if they're in police custody, they're going to get restrained at some point, right? I mean, they're not going to be transported unless they're uh, handcuffed and they're not going to get handcuffed in the front. They're only going to get handcuffed in the back because there's no such thing really as handcuffing in the front unless they have a waist chain for them. Okay. And most uh, sector cars would not have that. Okay. Again, less force is better than more force. Okay. Trying to talk to them versus restrain them. Okay. And, you know, sometimes you can talk them down to the point where, you know, you could explain to them that because of the laws, they have to be restrained, but, you know, they may be a little more uh, cooperative, okay? Okay, and then as far as properly restraining people, you know, we, we're not going to be the people that are going to be handcuffing people, but we do have sometimes have to, you know, uh, use cravats and stuff to restrain people. So ideally, we would never put them face down. Okay, so has anybody ever had this situation where, you know, they've had somebody who was restrained and they've gotten worse versus getting better? Has anybody had, had Anybody had anything like this? Everybody's unmuted. No? Thankfully, no. <laughs> okay. So you've never, you've never come upon somebody who was arrested that was on drugs or anything like that? I no, had a lady, they absolutely. were performing an exorcism on that stop breathing. You had a lady they were forming an exorcism on? Yes, we walked into her son kneeling on her chest on a cross, squirting holy water in her mouth. Only you, Julie. <laughs> yeah, I always get the best. So, well, listen, there's definitely strange stuff out there. Um, so I guess the take-home point of this is that, you know, this is a lawsuit waiting to happen. Besides, you know, obviously trying to do right by the patient, this is a lawsuit, you know, waiting to happen. So everybody's going to look to blame everybody else. So just, you know, Go in there with open eyes, manage the patient as best you can. Um, don't transport the patient face down, okay? And, you know, call early to the hospital so that they could have security, 
um, you know, meet you to help you, you know, with transferring the patient and everything like that. Okay, so does anybody have any questions on anything we went over tonight? I have a question um, sort of related to the, the laying prone and the stretcher mm -hmm. um, and how ARDS mm -hmm. and COVID had been treated um, with pronation. Yes, that, that is a pretty interesting thing. Um, I personally know someone who they wanted to intubate um, and he said, there's no way I'm getting intubated. Everybody who gets intubated dies. And that he read that laying face down, okay, was better for these COVID patients. And he laid face down for four days and did fine, survived and did fine. So I think it has to do, uh, Ron, I think you're right. I think it has to do with the, the excited delirium you know, component and the face down component, which obviously with the COVID patients, there wasn't that excited. These were you know, patients with COVID that they laid first uh, face down were conscious learn oriented patients that were able to follow commands, you know, were breathing spontaneously on their own and everything like that. But it's, it'd be very interesting, you know, whoever studies that to find out what the mechanism was, um, you know, because right now it's all theory, you know, but what the true mechanism was that made those patients uh, do better, you know, and like I said, I had a firsthand, I had a friend who, you know, did that. Um, they, they told him he was going to kill himself by not getting intubated and put on a ventilator. And he turned out to be the right one in the case because, you know, the other patients that were in the ICU with him that were intubated and, and uh, ventilated all died. So, wow. yeah. Yeah, you do not want to, I mean, if you're conscious and you're able to breathe and you're taught and able to talk, no matter what they tell you, you're not, you know, they're even saying that you shouldn't even be put, put on CPAP and BiPAP because there's chain barrel trauma to your, uh, your breathing receptors with it. So, you know, they said, as long as you're conscious and able to breathe, then you should be, you know, breathing on you your own. You want to stay there or no? So, no I'm sorry. Anything, anything else? Any other questions? Anything we want to go over? Well, I know this may seem a little unrelated, but we actually had a positive mm -hmm. COVID person who mm -hmm. was having a psychological episode, mm -hmm. uh, you know, very, very unstable. She was actually from, uh, a, uh, a community and um, we ended up having to cravat her hands because she kept removing her mask all the time and this was kind of in the in the height of you know the COVID situation but you know that was kind of an unusual circumstance she obviously psychologically couldn't understand you would say to her like you need to keep the mask on two seconds later she'd pull it off but she wasn't understanding because she was not herself obviously there was some psychological aspect of the COVID that was kind of taken over because it was not her norm at all. But, you know, we did have to cravat her. <clears throat> I believe that they had a hard time with her at the hospital as well. Right. So you have to be very careful restraining people because it's, you know, basically unlawful imprisonment, right? So if you're restraining somebody, really, you should have law enforcement involved. Now, again, I know the cops were not coming on EMS calls, but you'd have to basically say they were a danger to themselves or a danger to others. Now, in this case, if she was COVID positive and she's taking her mask off, she technically was a danger to you. Right. Um, so you'd, you'd have to be very careful because the argument could be made that is if you were wearing the correct PPE, the fact that she was taking her mask off was really not putting you at risk because you had proper PPE on and you would not be breathing in the virus. So you have okay. to be, you have to be careful, you know, like anything that has to do with restraining someone, forcing someone, you know, I mean, I was on a call the other day uh, up in tuxedo where there was a lady who called the police because she said she witnessed her son being attacked outside her house. So the cops knew her, she had a history and stuff like that. And the cops knew that her son was not living with her and the cops had the son's phone number. So they called him and said, are you in tuxedo tonight? He said, no, I'm in New York City. And he says, well, you know, mother's calling us saying you're being assaulted. And she, and he's like, well, you know, my mother has issues. They're like, yes. So anyway, you know, we, we put the mother on with the son and, uh, and she's still insisting that she saw it happen. But, you know, this is her normal state. She was not suicidal. She was not a danger to anyone other than she was calling the cops, you know, that, that particular day calling the cops every couple of hours with some kind of, you know, complaint that was not true. Anyway, she didn't want to go to hospital. So we called medical control, said this, told them the situation. They said they're fine with us leaving her. And that's that. So I get in the truck, I leave. And uh, all of a sudden, the police tell me to landline the police station. So I landline the police station. And they tell me the ambulance basically carried her to, the ambulance crew carried her to the ambulance and took her down to Good Sam. And I said, okay, what do you want me to do? You know, and they said, well, she didn't want to go. So I said, well, then that sounds like it's a police matter, you know, not my matter. I said, so if they 
you know, kidnapped her, then I guess, you know, there's some law that you could enforce that, you know, they're not allowed to kidnap her. So she got down there and the emergency room staff had a cow because she didn't want to be there. And, you know, they're saying, well, now we have to do something. You know, we can't just let her sign out. And, you know, it turned into like a big thing. You know, it turned now. I don't know whatever came of it because I just basically said I had nothing to do with it. You know, I mean, you know, I left. They wanted to. And their argument was they felt it wasn't safe for her to be left in the house. That was their argument. Like, in other words, they were looking out for her best interests. So I said, well, you totally disregarded her wishes. You know, well, she wasn't able to make her wishes. I said, well, she was conscious learn oriented. She knew who she was, where she was, her social security number, her date of birth, her son's date of birth. You know, I said, so, you know, the fact that she has these, you know, delusions every so often or, you know, um, or paranoia that people are doing things. I said, you know, I said, that's uh, her history. I said, but, you know, but I don't know whatever came of it. I mean, it was a big thing for a day or two. And uh, then it disappeared. So, but the cops were like, you know, you know, we could arrest them. I said, well, if that's what you want to do, I'm not getting in the middle of it. I said, you know, so you just have to realize, you know, if somebody were to press charges in that case and then kind of tie the cops' hands where they had to do something, they could have, we could have been reading a newspaper about four, you know, EMS people getting arrested. So, Sandra, you had a question? I did. Actually, I had a comment. Um, I worked for seven weeks in the hospital that I work at. Mm -hmm. We were using our oxygen hoods that we use in the hyperbaric chamber yep. on patients to try to keep them off of ventilation. Mm -hmm. We successfully managed to keep 54 patients from being ventilated. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Which was really, really awesome. Wow. So when you're saying oxygen hoods, are you talking, you're talking those, the, what, what's used in hyperbarics? Is that what you're talking yes, about? Yes, what we use, yeah, what we use in our hyperbaric chamber, it's a, it's a closed system hood okay. on 100% oxygen. Mm -hmm. And we were flowing them at 35 to 55 liters per minute. Wow. So we'd nice. never be able to do that in the field. No, right. but the, what I wanted to say is what I saw in these patients, the the delirium and the level of like they could be satting it. We got called in when they were satting below 90. Right. So we only had to start with in the hospital that I work at, we had 12 high flow nasal cannula setups. Mm -hmm. And now we have 24, but we had 12 to start with. So when those got exhausted, we had to look for other options. So they called us in and we set this up and we were working 24 seven for seven weeks. Wow. But I mean, um, but we, we had patients satting in the 80s who could talk to us, but they were nowhere near, you know, AN or ANO times three, what we consider ANO times three. Mm -hmm. You could say something to them, they'd respond to you. Um, but they were, it was not a safe environment for them. So, with, with putting the oxygen hoods on them, it was a closed environment. So, it was safer for everybody going into the room because it's a, a closed environment. So none of the virus was getting out. And a lot of these patients were in negative pressure rooms. Um, but what we saw was a lot of these people still had to be intubated. So even though now they're saying, oh, if somebody's satting in the eighties and they can still talk to you and they seem coherent, they're really not. I mean, the level of delusion and just not knowing really what was going on it was it was very extreme. So which which patients were you able to successfully manage just with the high flow O2 versus them having to be intubated? We had patients ranging in age from 23 to 97. Mm -hmm. So we had the whole gamut. Um, we had about 70% of them had underlying conditions and comorbid comorbidities. Um, but we had a lot of patients who responded really well. And the ones that we couldn't keep off of being intubated, we at least kept them at least two days. Okay. From being intubated. So, you delayed yeah. the intubation. And do delayed you know how, intubation. and how did the ones that eventually got intubated do? Did they ever come off the vents? They did. We had, we had out of our patients, we had 98 patients and 54 we stopped from being ventilated okay which is amazing right the ones that were ventilated um we had i think i don't know the final totals i think it was like around 10 that actually got extubated 
mm -hmm. that did not have to be reintubated or did not like actually survived. So that's pretty impressive. There was I did see some big hyperbaric doctor guy talking about how you know, he was getting, he had ideas of how hyperbarics could help yeah. these patients, but he was getting pushback from the pulmonologists and stuff like that. Yeah, we uh, actually worked with our head pulmonologist, pulled us into this, and we yeah. actually had a, uh, a study into the board to, to get, like, we, we wanted to treat patients in our chamber, mm -hmm. um, but this, it didn't get pushed through far, like, quickly enough, so we couldn't actually treat hy patients in hyperbarics with COVID. Okay. But if this comes around again, we're set up to do it. Okay. So very good. Thank you for sharing that. Okay. Does anybody have anything else um, for tonight? Okay. So everybody uh, have a good weekend, stay safe. And we'll, uh, I guess we'll try again next month. Okay. All right. Thanks. Frank. Okay. Good. Thank, Thank you. you. Take, Take, care. Take care. Everybody have a good night. Thank care. you. Thanks. Bye. Good night. Bye. 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 Feel better. Thank you. Frank, are you going to send the test over to us? Yep, I'm going to mail it out to Pete in one minute. Okay, thanks. Oh, thanks. Take care.